I guess it's up to the, uh, the AV team. Is it okay, Dan? Okay. All right, my name is Tom Thornton. Steve Langdon is my co-chair. We're uh, chairing this session on fisheries, and uh, we've got a number of people presenting, so we're going to get right into it. And there's a little change in the program, but the first presenters are actually Judy Ramos and George Ramos from Yakutat, and they'll be talking about uh, traditional management of salmon in the Yakutat area. So Judy and George. I just wanted to say thank you for the honor of uh, inviting our family here and for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us. I just wanted to introduce my 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 mother and my my grandpa. Yakta Kwan Dach Yeshna Gnech Kwan Tisket. My mother is a raven from the Gnech Kwan, the Copper River clan, from the Tisket, the Owl House. My grandfather, Uchtachwishu Duasak, Shukna Khadi, Ishk Hit, a Khidi. My grandfather's name is Wushchakhuish. He's from the Shuknachadi, the Coho Salmon Clan, and he's from the Khishit, the Frog House. And it's Chish. Goodness, Chish. My son's a lot taller than me now. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta bring this town. Um, I thank you for um, all your patience. I know it's it's been a long other other way, couple of days, but I really appreciate <coughs> you um, coming to our presentation. And um, I'll just go into this. This is um, the study was done. Um, we started the study about 2002, 2003, and at that time we had two two grants. One is to um, map the traditional use areas of the Yakutat clans and traditional territories. The other study that um, I was hired to do by the tribe was the traditional uh, ecological knowledge of Klinka people concerning the sockeye salmon fishery of the dry bay or Gunaku. And the other author with me is uh, Rachel Mason. She is with the National Park Service. What happened was um, this area was called the East Alsac River and all of a sudden there was a great decline in the sockeye salmon return. So they devised a four-year study to look at why this was declining and uh, the study I did was um, combined with the other study. So our objective in the study was to document traditional thing and knowledge on salmon management and utilization in the dry bay area to compare um, Klingit management styles to contemporary methods and reconstruct the role of clan affiliation in traditional resource allocation and management. And what we did is the literature review, interview with tribal elders, and we produced an annotated GIS map and a final report. And the first thing I did, of course, is um, I know that this whole study was not uh, traditional, so what I did is I wrote a letter to um, Dr. De Laguna, who's understood the Tlingit people and also understood the Western science. And she wrote me a beautiful letter. Um, and she says, of course, I know who you are. You're the grandchild of uh, Olaf and Abraham. Give up this thought of Western management system. That's not the way Tlingit people. And it sort of really gave me a boost because I knew that I, I would her letter and her backing, I could go and really do the traditional knowledge of the study, not base it on traditional Western management systems. So this is what I did when I went through the study. A lot of you already know this, but um, basically I've done this presentation a couple of times for uh, a non fingered um, audience, so you'll have to get uh, go through what I, I usually do for um, 
non-Clinket or non-Native audience to give them a little introduction to our people. So I gave them a little bit of prehistory when our um, Raven's uncle, he caused the great flood that forced people into canoes and on the tops of the highest mountains. And this is where a number of our clan origin begins. On the western side, of course, there's the On Your Knees Cave. And uh, Dr. Michael Krause looks at the uh, Lingit language separation proto Athabascan some 46,000 years ago. Now, you guys all know this, but remember I'm doing this for a non Lingit audience. <laughs> Uh, Tlingit people are matrilineal, they follow the mother's lineage. We live in a uh, geographic area known as Kwan, made up of different clans. The Akita area were made of three Kwans, the northern people, which is the Gatiyakka Guantan people, and uh, Iyak people they were called, my area, which is the uh, Yakita Kwan people, and then uh, which are composed of the my clan, the Gane Kwan, the Tekwe Di, and then the Gunaku Kwan, which is the Dry Bay people, which are made up of um, uh, three other clans. So we're, we are divided into two uh, exogamous Moetis, Raven and Eagle, and then the Yukon people, which are the Crows and the Wolf. And I, I, here's my, uh, I spent a couple years living in Canada with the Yukon, and uh, I really appreciate um, all the um, uh, people coming down, the Tlingit people, you know, and we do share a lot of the history and stories. And the Alsac area, of course, goes up into the Yukon area, and so we have a long history of uh, inter-migration and stories in that area. So each of these clans are divided into houses, and we are separated into three classes, aristocrats, commoners, and slaves. Now the pictures on there, of course, are, the top picture is, um, La Perouse at Latouille Bay, and the second picture on the bottom is uh, Malaspina at um, Port Mulgrave, which is a whole other story, of course. Dry Bay area, when I first came and um, got my first bachelor's degree in anthropology, my first assignment was to do a, um, some subsistence um, research in the Dry Bay area. And when I went, the first thing when I did is when I talked to the elders, they would give me these long stories about the mythologies and things like that. And here I was supposed to be doing subsistence mapping. It had nothing to do with what I was supposed to be doing in my job. And I went back to my bosses. I said, I can't do this, you know, because this has nothing to do with what I'm supposed to be doing. I was supposed to be mapping, trapping in very areas, and they always give me the, the elders always give me these mythology stories. So it was a real clash between the two um, thoughts there. But the yeah, uh, Dry Bear area has a lot of. Uh, historical and cultural significance. This is where Raven opened the box of daylight, where he pulled ashore through the house or canoe filled with animals. My dad was referring to that area uh, when he was talking about the, the bungee cord, if you guys were listening to that story earlier. Bear Island is the whale that Raven flew out of. Here Raven tricked the keen salmon into coming ashore. Here is where Raven threw away his wife's sewing basket and a big keen salmon. Stomach. The upper Alsac is the Shangukadi, where the Shangukadi Dewoy was left behind by accident and rescued by the Thunderbirds. This is the house crest, just that's in the picture there. This has a lot of really interesting geology there. Um, this is, for our stories, it's represented by the pole under which the old woman underneath shakes when she's hungry. And so it's uh, located at the um, Gulf of Alaska. It is the delta of the Alsac River. The ground in this area has been rebounding at an astounding rate, uh, faster than any other place on Earth. A village on the Tatachini Alsac disappeared when the ice dam gave away, releasing Lake Alsac in a volume of water six times out of the Amazon. This story is recorded in our oral history, of course, and some of the villages that used to be along this river were totally wiped out and flooded out to the sea, and it separated those people into different clans. And that's a whole different story again. In uh, 1958, this earthquake centered at Latua Bay, measured 8.3. Now the top picture is the sand blows that were created by these. And then this bottom picture shows where the Alsac uh, low glacier closed off the Alsac Lake and, be and it became Lake Alsac. And it, it flooded out in the mid-1850s. Mm -hmm. yes, Uh, <clears throat> you can see where the glacier blocked off the top.
Kasahini and Ayasa. And I used to listen to the stories that belonged to the Koho uh, clan. What happened is, one day, the people down in the lower dry bay, which is our part of our land as the Koho clan, were there. And that morning when they got up, the river was rising. But we didn't think too much of it, and I guess it's like stopping in one of these valleys or lowlands, and then when the rain fills up, it starts pouring on the upper part of it, a big flood starts coming down. So this is what happened. And I used to hear the story when Dry Bay flooded, he and Hakawu walked, the water broke. And uh, part of the clan, part of the Koho clan, saved themselves to toward the dry bay, as you see it there, on St. Elias Mountain. Part of them went right into the Gulf of Alaska, walked down. And some of them saved themselves to the east side. <clears throat> the ones that saved themselves to the east side moved down to Latuya Bay. And it's my understanding that they changed their name. And one of them just stayed on that little island, which La Perouse uh, named, and they called themselves Kutka'ai. And the ones that moved further down are called Kutka'i. And for this reason, their names, their history, their songs, by them are the same as ours from the Yakutat area. We are one people. The houses that were built, seven houses that I know of in the <coughs> Koho clan area, Kuseich we call it, on the Akwe River. Some of them were rebuilt here in Sitka. They did not hit which was going to be called the Kikche Hit, Yai Hit, and Tai Hit, that were rebuilt here in Sitka. So, the history of all of this reverts back to a small place, a river right outside of the driveway called Aqua. Uh, 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 and we call it a big village, we call it Kutsaya. And they always used to tell her when they told her the story. There were so many people in Dry Bay that the ground used to shake when they were walking around. And the way, way I heard it is called the arm. And so I just want to put that in. Uh, I'll never have a daughter that can stand up here and tell you all the stories because I haven't told her all the stories yet. <laughs> this is just a brief um, look at the different clans. There's um, base, this is after the flood. These are the ones that were left here after this flood that event that he talked about. There's the ravens, they're uh, Sukhahati. Their house, main house is the Canoe Pra house. Lashunahati, they had those houses that um, my dad mentioned. There's stories behind that, we're skipping all that. <laughs> Jock uh, houses. Chungu Kadi or Dagistana had the Thunderbird house there, and the Kagwantan had the box house there. Um, did you want to talk about this part? Like I said, <clears throat> the uh, Tehkwili, which migrated up on the outside, they call them Ayatda'ayi Tehkwili. They came from Tonkas up to Yakata. And as you can see, this picture here, the gentleman, big, he's the chief of the Tehkwili, and the lady is his wife, 
also the clock of Han, and the grandfather and grandmother of Judy. But what I'd like you to remember about this picture is that blanket in the back shows the Anklan River, which I was talking about that they settled in. That is the deed to our river. The same as the deed is of the Mount Edgecombe, which I saw in uh, Angoon. This is the we are so indeed. They say, why do you own that country? Because they bought it and they have the deed right there. This lower one is a Thunderbird. It's the Italian River. And their deed is right there in back of them. The Thunderbird and the river. That's how we run our land holding. Like I said, land ownership is the number one law. If it wasn't for that law, Yakutak <coughs> wouldn't have drove the Russians out of our land because they were abusing our land, our resources, our people, and reason. They were taking our children to say that they're going to take up a Kodiak and train them in the Russian culture and then send them back. None of them ever came back. So, this is what I want to mention on this one. So, the, this um, clan leader's duty was to protect the clan's hunting and fishing territories. He determined when and where, with what weapons his people and others might hunt or fish with, how many animals each man might take. The house leader, along with the men and women council, helped rule areas where people can hunt and fish. The clan leader determines when they're going to hunt. And just like the tradition game says, what area they're going to hunt. And if his law is violated, well, they'll break up your canoe, your spears, and stuff, and kick you out of them. Especially if you go into somebody else's land. So this is uh, what happened in two, or two areas of uh, Yakata, and I just think you will get to a, a slide of that, and uh, I'll explain the, there what happened. This next one is, um, the clan leaders determined where the weirs and chops were to be placed and who might spear or gaff fish. The chief watched the salmon runs and where there were two fish going up, he would order the nuts taken down for a day or two. This picture is from the mouth of the Lost River where you can see the remnants of some of the fish steaks there. And um, there's this whole, um, the paper just on the Lost River is really going to, would, would take a whole history. But um, we have huge box traps, um, remnants that were found there in the mud. And these are found in Myra, I don't know if Myra's here, Myra. Uh, this is when we went down and took a look and found so much um, remnants of all these Weirs and traps there. Uh, Seatuck River used to be traditionally managed, and they had a white flag which they would, the chief would raise at the Seatuck River when he wanted the fishing stopped. The same thing at Dry Bay at John Williams Creek. Um, he would stop and manage the fishing up to the time that the fishing game took over. Our, tra <clears throat> our traditional rules that were handed down to us. Once the salmon comes to the mouth of the river, you never make any noise. Kukcha, they call it. You don't do that. The salmon are going to have the noise and they're going to go out and into another river. You never bother the salmon until they come inside of the stream and up a little ways. And you will find that some of those traps that we found uh, in the Yaktad area are up to three-fourths to a mile upriver. And each clan has their own traps and each clan has their own river. So we're going to that a little deeper level. Um. 
Klingit philosophy and the ecosystem, Klingits believe that animals had soul like human beings, so um, they believe that inside, between the earth and sky, everything was alive with spirits, or life force called the ache, and some resided upon the sky itself. Klingit, um, this is a quote here, Klingit native people felt that they were living in one world with the plants and animals and fish. They believed that animals had souls like human beings and animals were once men. Myths from the beginning of time tell when raven people were still living in darkness. Raven opened the box of daylight and on the people and that's when they turned into the animals of the robes they were wearing. So this is what George wanted to talk about here. I think you've heard from quite a few different speakers that our world and our clicket world made for us by the raven, everything has a spirit or a soul. And when this raven told us how you will treat these different animals, it used to surprise me that if you kill the bear, when they go hunting in the fall time, you will take the head off the bear and you will bury it facing the mountain so he can go back to his land. There's a lot of the different animals where they have the spirit and you appease one. And a lot of these stories are very interesting. We could be here for months talking about them, each one. Some in the area neighborhood of Taboo, sick loss, and some of them how to treat the animal after you have killed it, because the spirit will go back. And it, my uncle used to tell me that when you kill an animal, you start taking care of it right there. If it's a seal, you cut it a little bit, and if it's a bear, if you have to leave it overnight, you have to cut it, or else the bear spirit is going to go back into their land and say, don't go to that man because he didn't treat us right. When you look at, uh, when I was researching this also, this is the same like the Athabascan, people believe the same thing about the salmon, and they had the salmon boy stories saying. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the chance to talk. I sit on the salmon board in the Yukon Territory, and we were negotiating for 17 years with Alaska, we're trying to get an agreement on the salmon. We finally got it, and I think it was 2003, we finally got an agreement. And then we, they took us back, and then we had to go for another year before we had to fight for the quota. We have our First Nations people from a few of the communities sitting on the board and I was an elder at one time. We switched back with elders going. Also, I live in southern Yukon. About a hundred and maybe 150 miles from the divide of the headwaters of the Yukon. 150 miles the other side of us, the water flows into the Mackenzie, and this side it goes into the Yukon River. The salmon are very important to us. They start off to come up to us in their spawning grounds in June. They start up the Yukon River. And they come all the way along. We don't commercial fish. They commercial fish at Dawson City, and that's the only place. Uh-uh, oh, uh, up the river, she can get live along the river, all the way along, First Nations people. 
We just take enough, they take enough just to eat. They don't sell it, they don't commercialize it. By the time it comes to Tesla, where we, where we live, if the water is high, it's good salmon. If the water is low, it really isn't. You can't can it. We just dry it. And then we just take enough. We live at the headwaters, like I told you, and they bypass us and they keep on going to the river. Thousands of miles they come home with us. They are, they live where we live. They're born where we live. That's their home. Here a few years ago, uh, that was five years ago, uh, five or six years ago, we noticed the, the flack in the salmon. We just, you know, you people, you don't know. Because you live in the ocean, close to the ocean. You don't live, you live in the mouth of the rivers, where the rivers flow up where they go. You see all of them just going, just thick. But by the time they get to our place, there's none that's there. Because the fishermen, they're too free. You have to use your own heads. Aon <coughs> Paolo gave us that food. He gave us the master over it to look after it. There's so many things that we are not looking after. <coughs> and salmon is one of them. We have that salmon board really strong. We have one of the board members live right in our community and that's all he does, he goes. He goes from one place and one country to the other, fighting for that thing. And trying to make people realize, just because there's a lot there that it's really swimming in the mouth of the rivers, doesn't say that there's thousands for thousands and thousands, no. I ask you people to really think. Just take what you really truly need and let the rest go. We as people of Tesman, we see it. There's a great story with that thing, with every animal that an uh, owl put on this earth. In Tesman, we live by a great big lake. It's 90, 89 miles long, but the biggest part's in BC. And that's where they come up them salmon. And you can tell, it's the end of July by the time they come to us. The last week in July and then in August. And that's the only time you see the winds blowing on our lake. This blows like that all of a sudden, just big waves. All of a sudden they see that wind come this way. Huh, you see them water, the waves come hit one another. And the clinket people in our village, hey, you see that wind? Yeah, somebody come. We know this is salmon. They, our clinket people, our storytellers, he comes up on the lake and he's tired after all that long journey. Oh, what the fest on the lake. No current. And he looks across and he wants to go across. He turns around and he puts up his sail at his fins. And he wishes the wind to blow him. And he just floats up and that wind is him up and takes him over. But in the meantime, another salmon is over there and he wants to come this way. And he does, and that's when that wind goes like that on our lake. That's how we know they're there. And that's the only time of the year is when that salmon come. The end of July, August, and September. 
the rest of the time that lake is calm and it doesn't gust like that. We really have a fight on our hands with the fishermen on the Yukon River in Anchorage. We go down there. It really is. They open with their salmon, with everybody. Look into it yourself. The tourists can come and they can. We see tourists coming and they come from Seattle all over and they can fish there and then they don't pay for license or nothing. It's camp and the camp is fishing ground. Now, I read in the paper before I came home, <coughs> they're going to run boats up the Taku River to take the ore out of that Telsaquam mine. The salmon, what is going to happen to the salmon? Who's going to fight for them? That's up to each and every one of you people right here to stop that. You look into it. Maybe it's not going to hurt. I don't know. But that's what I read in the paper. They're going to, from that Telsaqua mine, they're going to bring them boats to, to Juno, bringing that ore out of there. That's where we get our salmon, good salmon. We can't eat the ones that come up the Yukon River because they're so thin. It's just like chewing on a willow when you we dry it. We are fighting as the Taku River people for that not to happen. That's where we get our salmon. It's close to you guys. Look into it. Don't let it happen. And if it can, and if they don't hurt the salmon, go ahead. Go ahead. But it's something for you to look into. It's very close to all of our hearts. I thank you for listening to me. It was through our First Nations people when we negotiated that time in Fairbanks. It was our native people, the white people all left us. We, they opened the meeting and they talked. And then that head lawyers, they said, well, let's just leave these First Nations people to get acquainted. That was the best thing they ever did. And they went out the door and as soon as they went out the door, their door closed, everybody said, Hi, you guys. We were all native people from along the river in different communities. We weren't strangers no more. And we made, we had a settlement then. after 17 years. Now they take so many fish, we're fighting about the quota. Give it lots of thought, you guys. Growing up as a boy, they used to say to me, Oh, the cup on the law. And I used to wonder what part of the world that was. But it's the people when you go up the Alsac River and you come to the land of headwaters of Tasahidi, which is called Kluk Shuk. We call it Kluk. Sure, which means the silver salmon cannot go any further. That's the end. That's a long lake. And they used to tell me, if you ever go there, make sure that you take seaweed. Because they like to trade for seaweed. And like I told you yesterday, I left my whole bag of seaweed laying on a couch. 
Mr. Chief, but I, what, what I want to speak a little bit about is we say that everything has a spirit. All salmon, all animals, the wind, the sun have a spirit. But if you look at the bottom line, it says, the salmon boy's story talks clickets, the proper behavior towards salmon and about salmon behavior. They'll tell you that story about Salmon Boy, and we call it the Moldy End. Because when the boy was snaring seagulls, what you do is you take a string and you tie a stick right in the middle of the stick. And then you take this stick and to put it into a piece of fish and you throw it out. And if the seagull bites it, then you yank on it. And the stick goes sideways and it's thrown. The Simon boy was this what he was doing. And all of a sudden he said, well, the jay's all hungry. He ran into the smokehouse or the lead. And he asked for something to eat. And they gave him some, some dry fish. And he looked at it. And he said, How come you always feed me this moldy fish? Shadow Kutlach is the name of the story, click it. Why do you give me this moldy fish? And he threw it back. And just then somebody hollered, something spit on your snare. He started running after it. And the seagull was flying out. And he grabbed that string. He's going to pull it back. But he went right down in the water. There's a lot more to the story. But they tell young people, they say that do not curse the salmon. And all he said was, why do you, he threw it, why do you give me this moldy salmon? And so this is where the story, boy, there's a lot more to it. We'd be sitting there for another two hours. But, uh, for what Pearl was saying, I was thinking all of you know someone that can help maybe write letters to your village council, A&B, um, Click and Haida, your representatives, anyone you know, maybe write a letter saying that we need to conserve the Yukon salmon. This other one um, is basically a subsistence. Now what I wanted to emphasize here is we not only utilized salmon, but we utilized everything within our land. We were seasonal people, we migrated to different areas. We had a broad knowledge of our area where salmon is and what species they were. Like in our area, people, uh, we have um, mainly the sockeye, the coho, um, those are the ones, and the keen salmon are the ones that we really use a lot. And we had all different methods of um, harvesting these. Certain salmon stored well. Now I know we had sockeye and keen, but people fit, used a lot of the coho because coho was uh, easy to dry and stored well and didn't mold um, through the whole winter. It was basically fall. In the Yakutat era, the fall, when the people would go to their um, fall fishing area, they would harvest three to five hundred pounds of salmon. And so it was a, a very more large part of their diet. On um, subsistence, <clears throat> one time I went up to the river, Anklin River, my grandfather's land. And as we were entering there, there was a man called Dr. Longenbaugh, which I went up with, very famous in Sitka. He wanted to go hunting with me. We met a boat coming down, and when I looked into this boat, there was a calf moose. There was a set of antlers, and there was two hindquarters. 
And I thought it was very funny that this man had left most of the moose up there from his high quarters. So we went up river hunting. And the way you hunt moose in Arbor, you climb a tree and look back on a flat desert. And you could try to call up a moose. I'm pretty sure that the people from up there can grunt pretty good like a moose. I, I learned it. <laughs> but a story, I climbed a tree, a good area, and as I was climbing a tree, a bear started running. A doctor was coming up behind me. I said, doctor, there's a bear running. Watch it. And he said, yes, there is. There's another one running the other way. And I thought that was very odd. And just after that, there was a clump of trees back further, and the wolf started hollering. Ooh. Somebody told me that the hair can stand up on the back of your head. Well, mine did, because there was nothing. Maybe there's three wolves there, but it sounds like there's a hundred of them, because their voice is so loud and strong. And then the doctor called me. He said, the bear has covered up something down here. And when I got down there, there was a bull moose with the antlers cut off. There was a cow with the hind quarters cut off. The doctor took pictures of it as his were telling a fishing game. We went to the fishing game Often, and we told him exactly what happened and what we saw. And he sat back on his chair and he said, well, it's probably the local boys. I got so mad, only two times I got that mad, I guess, steam was coming out of my ears both sides. And I says, local boys do not eat antlers. So I wanted to pass that on, what can happen? We don't kill anything until we're going to use it. The, this next slide shows the, the box trap found in the Lost River. And uh, it's really unique because it's about, how long is it? Do you remember, Myra? It's about 40 feet long? Two what? Over two meters. It's a really, they're really huge box traps, and they they had inner ones when they they would lift it out. Uh, this is the household harvest when we did the survey in Yakta for 2000. Um, our most preferred species. So 51 percent of our household use set nets to harvest mostly sockeye and chinook. 37 percent of our household use rod and reel to catch mostly cohos. 29% uh, removed it from commercial set. The average household here harvests about 68.7 salmon with a total weight of 394 pounds. About 72% of our households took salmon from the Sea Duck River. Um, this is the last one, but uh, this is the where we came into conflict with the Western system in beginning 1881 at Cloac where the Tlingit drove off cannery saners taking fish near their fish uh, their villages. This is the um, insignia, this is when the Navy was there. Nicholson was sent in at the request, given their chief official papers recognizing their status. In 1890, the Hootsnulu protested white fishing at, uh, how do you say that? Still? Sitko? Sitko Bay. Uh, insignia Robert. Coots was sent with six Marines and an interpreter to explain the whites' point of view and arrest any Indian who might interfere with them. In 1897, the Tlingit Orthodox chief sent a petition to the president asking for help in stopping the Baranaut Packing Company from taking away their bays, streams, and lagoons and throwing bars and traps across the streams. In 1888, federal legislation outlawed Aboriginal traps and rears, and a year later, Commercial fish traps were permitted. By 1927, there were 799 traps in Alaska, and in that total, there were 
575 traps in southeast Alaska. They were locked to fish night and day, seven days a week. Nearly all the traps were owned by whites or canneries owned by whites. So this is um, here. Traditional Thlingit management of salmon was based on a territorial management by clans. Clan leaders with their council had the authority and responsibility to direct and manage resources. Exploitation waste industry spectra salmon was taboo and believed to be offensive to the spirit of the salmon. Clinkets utilized different locations and fishing methods based on the species of salmon they were harvesting. Traditional methods of management is different from contemporary methods where fishing sites are now privately owned, allocation is by permit, and the state is divided into regulatory areas <coughs> and state by plant territories. So this is the thank you is to the elders of Yakutat, Dr. Dale Laguna, Wayne Howell, Morgan Howard, Catherine Moncrief, Bob Schroeder, and the Southeast Regional Subsistence Committee. I'd like to tell you, subsistence, subsistence to us is living off the land, as they call it. But we crave that food. My daughter and her sister sitting up there or someplace here, they went to Germany going to school. And when they write home, they said, of all things, she said, would you send us some dry fish and crackers? <laughs> uh, that's what they requested because that's what they like I wish to eat. Subsistence. Now we have to fight tooth and nails to retain some of our food, which is our way of life. And every once in a while, somebody gets the high horse and they says, well, you can't do this, you can't shoot the whale, you can't shoot the walrus, you can't shoot the sea lions, you can't shoot the uh, moose, like a car cross. And that made me angry. And I was talking to a lawyer, and he was talking that same line. Well, we've got to regulate it, we've got to serve it. You're not regulating moose, whale, walrus. You are regulating people. Let's look at this. And so I told him, let's back up a little bit. Can you imagine, try and imagine, what would happen if all of a sudden you said, you Italians cannot eat spaghetti? <laughs> the Chinese, you people cannot eat rice? You would have a trouble, a lot of trouble. And that is the same way all across the United States, from Red Cloud, Cochise, Geronimo, Sitting Bull, Chief Joseph, like the attack, did away with the Russians. We were fighting for our way of life, same as those people that crossed the United States. I just want to leave that with you because in order to look into the future, as you people will do, you have to look back. History has a way of repeating itself. And when you try to tell the younger people, this is what's going to happen, this is what, a lot of young people look at you and say, oh, that's old stuff. That's what they say, that's old stuff. Well, I guess they learned the teaching from the TV. I talk pretty strong, talk pretty loud, because the old stuff is what I used to sit around the fire. And I said, Herman, we determined that if you don't learn these things and you try to live by the culture, him and I would probably say, ooh!
that uh, just uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, the method of uh, taking salmon and other fish using traps and just to run through a few of the different kinds of traps there's there's stone traps where uh, using uh, the tide to entrap uh, schools of fish when the tide goes out and then there are uh, weirs that are uh, put across streams that have uh, that constrict the salmon to certain areas where traps are put in place. This is on the Chilkoot River. And this is one of the traps in the Chilkoot where the fencing that, that goes down into the stream bed, it herds the salmon into those areas where they can be constricted into a trap. This is uh, uh, on the uh, Na Nasser Skeena River, I'm not sure which, but this is a salmon trap that's uh, similar to the one that was found on Montana Creek, although uh, we're not sure what type of fish was uh, what they were going after with that one. There's several species of fish that run up Montana Creek, so we're not sure which, which it is, but it is similar to this. It's a, a cylindrical trap about nine feet long or so, three feet in diameter, that's all lashed together with spruce roots. There are a few uh, traps that it, were collected in the late 1800s that um, are similar to the one that was found on Montana Creek. This is a hooligan trap from, uh, I believe that it's uh, the Taltan people that's uh, similar, although instead of having hoops, they've taken a, a piece and spiraled it down the length of the trap, and uh, that, that's the way they make the traps on the Yukon River as well. Of course, uh, salmon is, uh, is, is uh, like George was saying, George and Judy were saying, it's uh, central to the uh, culture of the, of the Northwest Coast. And uh, the fact that so many salmon, salmon and fish images appear in the art speaks to that. The people, of course, had a long tradition of, uh, of celebrating uh, each year when the first salmon of each species was taken, there would be a first salmon ceremony. And that's uh, a ceremony that's been renewed in recent years among the Haida by Robert Davidson. This is one of the masks that he uses. And Klingit art has a lot of salmon Im imagery in it. There are uh, many of the clans have salmon houses. These are some house posts from the Gunaktadi Dog Salmon House in Klekwan. This is a, a, a road from the Coho people here that has fish imagery. I think it's uh, pretty interesting that the, the fish entering the center has its backbone cut. The, the circle suggests a, a, a salmon hole, and that fish entering it was, is, uh, got its backbone cut. There's a house front painting in, in that Angoon or Tillisnew with salmon heading towards the hole. Ishkitan. There's a, a few masks and uh, headdresses around that seem to actually represent fish traps. This is one that has a, what appears to be a fish trap that has a mask that raises and lowers up inside of it. And even in basketry, the fish, fish traps, or a fish where there's a basketry motif that uh, is suggestive of the fencing that's used for constructing a fish weir. And that's what the, those uh, series of horizontal lines stacked up. That's the salmon trap design, or fish weir design, sorry, in spruce root basketry. So uh, uh, George and Judy talked about the Salmon Boys story. Since we're on traditional kick study ground here, we should uh, use, uh, bring up the name Octotzin. That's the kick study version of that story. And that, uh, that concept of a boy who goes away to the village of the salmon people to live among them and then comes back with special knowledge, that motif shows up a lot in the art by having uh, figures that are half humanoid, half salmon, or half fish. 
I'll run through a couple of them here. There's a halibut hook that has a little human cr uh, curled up in the belly of the fish. And this is a, a rattle that has a, a little humanoid figure that's in the belly of the salmon that rattles back and forth. It's a pretty amazing piece. And this is actually a soapberry spoon, but the handle on this is just like that rattle. It's got a little tiny humanoid figure that rattles back and forth inside the rib cage. And uh, a couple of people I know have looked at this and they think that that humanoid was actually carved inside. They never, they didn't split it open, put the little guy inside and glue it back together. It was carved by using carving knives between the ribs. It's all one piece. That's the back of the, of the uh, blade of the soapberry spoon, an incredible carving. The salmon traps, too, had ownership markers. George and Judy talked about the ownership of fishing areas, and uh, there's a couple of uh, fish trap markers in existence that seem to suggest that same Salmon Boy story. This is one at the Burke Museum that has that motif. And this is one, I, I'm not sure which museum it ended up in, but it's, uh, it shows a shaman on one of these salmon, salmon trap stakes, uh, an ownership uh, marker, and the fact that it's a shaman might, might be that uh, the, the boy, Octatsin, when he comes back to his people, he has special knowledge that he obtained by living with the salmon <coughs> people, and he became a shaman, and this might be Octat seen after he's returned to his people. So, uh, getting back to the Montana Creek Trap in about 1990, um, a fisherman reported uh, that he was out at the mouth of Montana Creek and saw what he thought was a fish, fish trap or fish weir that was eroding out of the bank. And he contacted Wally Olson and Wally called me and we went out there and sure enough there was what we thought was fencing that was washing out of the bank and it was, uh, you could tell it was hand carved and there was actually spruce root lashing left on it. It was right where this bank was collapsing. And uh, about a week later we went out there and a huge part of it had been exposed and a lot of the spruce root lashing had been ripped away. So we had to take immediate action. We took uh, this part out of the, the mud, it had been covered over with mud, and as soon as we lifted that out, we could see there was more underneath, and we knew we had an entire fish trap at that point. So about a year later, with, after a lot of fundraising and, and a lot of volunteer effort, we got an excavation together that was led by Bob Betts and John Loring to actually uh, excavate that trap. It was half underwater, so they had to build a dam of sandbags and pump water out from behind it to expose the trap. And this is uh, the trap when it was first emerging. That's the cone that went in the large end of the trap. And this is it when it was mostly uncovered. And it had to be kept wet constantly because that the wood and the root was so old that uh, if it was allowed to dry out before it could be treated, it would just turn to powder. So they had to keep it wet the whole time. And what, what they were trying to do was preserve as much of this lashing as possible. That's some of the original lashing before they tried to lift that out of the ground. And even though it was still intact, it no longer had any strength to it. So you couldn't just grab the sides of the trap and lift it up. You had to get something underneath it. So it took a bunch of people working about three weeks to figure out how to do that. They made a stretcher for it. They worked webbing underneath it, lifted it out, brought it back to the museum, and we put it in polyethylene glycol and let it soak in there for about a year. And that allows the, the root and the wood to be preserved once you let it dry out. If you just let it dry out, it wouldn't hold up. So this was a necessary step. So after that happened, then uh, all of the the roots that had been wrapped in gauze to protect it had to be unwrapped. It was a really delicate operation. Ellen Carley at the State Museum and uh, several other people helped to carefully unwrap the gauze and try to keep those roots intact. It was uh, quite a 
a meticulous process, but it's pretty exciting to see that original root emerge from underneath the gauze. There were places where it had to be reinforced, though, so we had to uh, make those kind of rusty brown color reinforcements to go over the original lashing just to try to keep it intact. It was really fragile. So finally, the last step was taking the trap a few blocks from the State Museum to the City Museum where it was going to go on display. And this, uh, this is, it's being lifted into a truck here, and that's about a $10,000 mount that the trap is on for any of you interested in the museum side of things. It's a pretty expensive operation to mount something like that. But uh, from the moment we were uh, involved in, in the, the trap, Jan and I were just totally captivated by the idea of traps and by the meaning of traps, and we always thought we'd like to, to make one ourselves, and we got the chance to do that. Actually, we've done two now, and it takes a while to accumulate the material, so and I wanted to turn it over to Jan here to briefly talk about the process of getting the roots for such a thing. Uh, this is a good area for uh, spruce root gathering. Um, we want to do it in the spring, and fall is, is a nice time to... Um, Mary Lou King and I, after they dug the fish trap up, we, um, we always had big roots on our mind. Before, we were digging mostly small roots. <coughs> and, uh, so every time we'd go out, we'd see a nice large root, um, which, we, which what is what you'd use on a fish trap. Um, we would say, this is for the fish trap that we're going to make. We never knew when or how we were going to do it, but ever since they dug it up, we decided that that is what we needed to do, was to gather roots. And so it was spoken of on every root gathering trip. This is a root for a fish trap. So uh, um, without her help, um, the traps that we've made wouldn't, wouldn't be. We'd still be out there digging. So um, it's a long process, and... Um, you can't dig anywhere. You have to dig where it's nice and sandy, where the roots grow straight. You need nice straight roots and you need to uh, split them very carefully and uh, dry them and store them. So we had boxes of uh, large roots waiting for our fish trap. So um, this is a, an area where we went. And here's a, a root. This, the roots that we would use would be larger than that. You split them in half, and then you split the halves in half, and then you just keep splitting them down to their usable size. And uh, this is a small one with the outer bark on it. You can see the red, and you can see that it's in soil and not in a rocky area, so that it's kind of limiting where you can dig roots. <clears throat> this is Mary Lou. She's happy. With, she's found some pretty nice roots there. You've got to get down on your hands and knees and, uh, and dig with a digging stick. And um, it's sunny and it's spring. You can see not everything is, the snow is gone, but the, all the spring growth isn't quite up yet. You have to cook the root in a fire. Um, the big roots take longer, and the small roots, are, they are easily burned, so you have to cook them quickly. Um, you want that moisture in there because you have to remove the outer bark, and so, uh, you, if you overcook them, then you ruin them. And this is Mary Lou pulling a cooked root through an ina, and it's just a stick in the ground with a, a separation, and you can see the beautiful white root coming out after the outer bark has been removed. This is Ida Kadashan splitting a root. She came to visit uh, a class that we have at the university, and. Um, she was so generous to share her, uh, her knowledge, and uh, she's got a beautiful spruce root basket with her uh, roots in it and all her uh, weaving tools, and she's splitting a beautiful white root. It's a small root. That would be for a basket, not a, not a tool or a fish trap. And the, uh, in addition to the spruce roots, it actually took the longest time to, to harvest to get enough for a trap. And then the other parts, of course, uh, were wood. The original trap used uh, hemlock, 
the long pieces, the staves, were hemlock, the hoops were spruce, and uh, I thought it would be a pretty simple matter to go around Juno finding spruce branches that would be, you know, the right size and, and length, especially to make about a two and a half foot diameter hoop, but actually we found that there's really, that those are a lot longer than the typical spruce branch, at least the ones that we found, and we had to search high and low for these, and um, we ended up getting, uh, getting enough to make, make our replica with, but it was quite a struggle. And then, um, just getting the, the uh, limbs to cooperate. I have a lot, a lot more respect now for, for spruce branches than I ever did before. They're incredibly strong and, and pliable. I, just, I think they're really, they're really great uh, to work with. And, they're cell, and on the cellular level, they're different than uh, wood from other parts of the tree. And they have some really special qualities to it, which I never realized before I started working with these. But uh, I used an adze to thin out the the thick end of the branch and a draw knife to, to smooth it out, try to get it as evenly thick as possible. And then I, I actually steamed these to try to uh, uh, get them into shape. I, I don't know if that was really part of the original process or not. And that's the thing, it, there is no instruction book on how to make these. Or We talked to elders in the Juno area and didn't find anyone that had any experience with these. The staves, though, were a little bit more straightforward. We had to find really straight-grained uh, hemlock and used a, a draw knife to round them up. This was actually, this is our first trap, and this one we weren't actually trying to make a replica of any particular trap. It was actually a, a work of art for Craig High School. We wanted to find a way to honor the salmon, all the salmon that, that uh, everyone depends on so, so much, and we proposed a mobile for the Craig High School, and, and uh, part of that mobile was a, a uh, representation of a fish trap, and this is it before we hoisted it about 20 feet in the air. And we also made a bunch of salmon that would be swimming around in front of the, the trap, and uh, we hung all that up, and that's what it looks like. The trap itself is um, is about 10 feet long, and then it has some some fencing on the side to suggest the way they would go across the stream with that. But they'd always leave part of it uh, without the fencing on, so some some fish could get through. And there are historic photos that, that show an opening in there, so they they would always let some get through. So getting back to our replica project, uh, the, this is. Uh, work on the replica and it was actually a lot more difficult than the first one because we were trying to make an exact copy of the old one and so that meant measuring the old one every possible imaginable way to make sure ours was going to be as close to it as, as it could be and uh, this is towards the end of the project that Mary Lou and Jan uh, worked on lashing that together. We actually worked alongside the old trap that's on display. Many hours and hours of splitting of roots there, and I'm sure if you laid them in the end, they'd circle the globe several times. That's uh, we had photos of the uh, lashing before they lifted the trap out of the water. We we mapped out the lashing technique and tried to reproduce it exactly. I think we got it pretty close. And uh, we had school groups there get into the act. They got to uh, try to split spruce roots and uh, learn about the construction process. We even got our grandkids involved in it. Literally. <laughs> that's, that's Abby. Yeah. She was getting a little claustrophobic at that point. And this is uh, the... Uh, Close to the final uh, day of construction, we had to make the uh, the funnel piece to go on the end, but uh, we got that done, and it's now hanging above the the exhibit case of the old one. But uh, we had a lot of uh, fun with the project. We also learned a lot, and there's no no replacement for actually to really understand uh, a, method, a fishing method like this and a 
a technology. There's no uh, a, a no uh, substitute for actually trying it yourself, and you start to realize things that you never would have uh, imagined originally. I think that the effort that goes into making them, you would treasure your fish trap and you would take very good care of it. So I think they probably repaired them and took very good care of them because it's an incredible amount of work. And I'm sure they, they had a lot of information that we didn't have. We kind of had to wing it on our own. And, uh, but it was a lot of work, but a lot of fun. And it was, it was uh, uh, a once in a lifetime chance to do something like that. Thank you. My name is Steve Langdon. Uh, I'm from the University of Alaska, Anchorage. And I've been uh, honored and uh, taught for over 30 years by um, elders and experts from the Inya Kwan, now most people along our home village in Kloak and uh, Punakau. So I'd like to uh, pay my respects to the elders and the um, uh, experts from those communities that have uh, trained me and, and uh, given me the opportunity to learn from them. This particular uh, idea and concept is, uh, the title of my presentation is called uh, Ish, Thinking About Sinket Relations with Salmon. And uh, this particular concept of Ish, this idea, emerged in the context of what I learned uh, from others <coughs> in both places um, in the context of a study about traditional ecological knowledge and use of salmon amongst the uh, elders and, of uh, Honokau and um, Inya Kwan. I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, Ken Austin, who was my co-investigator uh, in the uh, research in, amongst the Huna people, and he uh, did the transcriptions and the translations. We did, our, did uh, as much as we could in the language, I'm a full believer, firm believer that the language has embedded in it uh, discrete concepts. This particular concept of ish is an example because we, we uh, continuously uh, heard this concept and there are people here from, um, from uh, Yukon uh, who carry this as part of their actual identities and I'll have a little comment here later on. Those circles that uh, were on some of the, the house front and on the regalia those circles are, I believe, they are indications of the Ish concept in terms of the salmon returning to Ish. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, the philosophy. When I say thinking about Tlingit relations with salmon, I'm talking about the philosophical depth and, uh, that this particular concept conveys. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so those of you with quick eyes saw the uh, salmon fin down in the uh, front of that image and this means that below the water there is much to be learned below the surface there is much to be learned but you have to you have to persevere and you have to think deeply with the concepts that you're given <clears throat> so this is just a quick overview of where the Clink and Haida people occupy in their different Kwan regions in southeastern Alaska one of the things that we uh, discover in terms of our understandings of their the distribution is that the island groups tend to have uh, salmon streams that are relatively short and they have a, uh, a strong focus on the estuaries for their harvest. So as uh, on the mainland where you have longer systems, such as the one that Mr. Ramis was talking about earlier, also the Chilkat, uh, Taku, Stakin, Unup, all of those represent um, a different contexts and we really need a comparative study to understand more about uh, the, the differences in the traditional knowledge in these two different con contexts. So some of the research that I've done, that picture that you saw and we'll see later on, come from the Palak River, which is the uh, major river of the uh, Inya Kwan. What we see here is the name of the three discrete ponds that have now been unified together as Inya Kwan um, in, in the village of Palak. To the north, one of Kau, 
Um, the research area where I was able to be guided uh, by the uh, trustees of the stream, um, uh, Patrick and, and, and Thomas Mills, which we'll look at later on, is the Neva River, which is an excursion inlet. But uh, coming back to important uh, themes that uh, Mr. Ramos and, and Judy talked about in terms of the Salmon Boy story. In uh, academia, we call this something, we, we refer to this as a philosophical concept as, of, of what we call relational cosmology. Um, and in this particular philosophical system, uh, ontology, the nature of being, and this is that in all existence, as George spoke, is composed of willful, sentient beings, beings and forces. And what's, what's crucial then to the maintenance of all of us collectively in this system is respect that underlies our uh, collective similarities. And our interdependence is absolutely crucial. And we heard, heard this before, this is very central. The interdependence of all of the forms in this relational system. The continuity of our joint existence depends upon these principles of mutual benefit and reciprocal obligation. And the Salmon Boy story demonstrates that very powerfully. Humans must conduct appropriate ritual acts with the salmon <coughs> bones after they have processed and consumed them to ensure that they will be rejuvenated and have the opportunity to return. So the relational cosmology is a cyclical cosmology of return, use and return. And that's why relations and respect are fundamental. They have to return back to those who respect them. That's crucial to it. And this is the story that was mentioned before of how the Plinket use was saved from drowning by the salmon people. And he was taught uh, the behavior that it was necessary. And he realized that the salmon were people just as himself. And this comes from uh, Cyrus Peck's book in his uh, text. Now, uh, the salmon boy is a mythic charter, is what I refer to that as. A mythic charter means that it establishes the core principles and relationships between understandings about salmon on the one hand, and it teaches an interesting point about respect by using uh, an inversion example. That is, the lack of respect that the moldy boy shows is in turn what leads to the understanding. And very interestingly, in many of the uh, uh, interviews that we did with elders. There was often an account as they grew, as they sometimes referred to becoming aware of moments in which perhaps they violated this principle and they were brought the principle of respect towards salmon. And they recall very well the lessons that they were taught at that point. That's what they turn back to in terms of how that resonates and reverberates in their experiences and how they bring it forward. I want to make a, a brief comment about this because it, this particular image, you saw it earlier in, uh, in Steve Hendrickson's, uh, this is what is called a salmon steak, okay? Uh, and this, uh, this is not a, a piece of atu that is danced with. This is not an object that sits on the wall. It is an object that sits on the fish trap in the water so that sticks out above the water's level. Now one of the very important themes that comes back and is a part of Shinget behavior in their relationships with salmon is as salmon return, of course all of us who are able to be in the wonderful coastal environment know that salmon do what when they come to their streams? They're jumping. They're jumping out of the water. And that's in the Salmon Boy story. In the Salmon Boy story he stands up but because he was a salmon, he was in fact jumping. And he was told by the uh, chief of the salmon people to look, to see where you're going. So he's jumping to look. And when those jumps occur, salmon people immediately speak to them with loud cries to recognize them, to tell them they're on their way home. That's one of the important principles of relationship, is acknowledgement of your presence. But this object is also present. So that when the fish jump out of the water, they see this. And the other piece that he showed as well of the shaman, both of those two pieces as, as uh, stake traps, they're mnemonic devices that convey information to the jumping salmon. We know how we are to treat you. We understand the story that we have been taught. 
And this object is our sign to you that we know. But here is another deeper layer to that relationship. This object isn't just put together. It's not just merely crafted in, a, in an offhand way to be a message. It is an investment of deep artistic, emotional, and spiritual power. And it is that in part of Shingeth relations that is a true demonstration of respect. And this is how the philosophy then of relational cosmology, the understanding we can see flowing through all of these behaviors and acts as people intersect with salmon in their various different dimensions. So it's that thing that I want us to remember as we go forward and talk about uh, the ish as a special place. Uh, the mystic charter tells us that respect is crucial. Salmon are to be understood as people. They are first of all sentient, just like ourselves. They have feelings. Second of all, they are attentive. They're paying attention to what we do and how they are treated. <coughs> Third, they are volitional. They will be the ones that make the choices about which places they will return. And that will be based on the manner in which they're treated, the way in which respect is demonstrated to them. So this is what an issue is, and I want to thank uh, uh, Wanda Culp of, of, uh, of <coughs> who made this particular sketch. And uh, we're, we're, we're in a stream system, mostly sometimes the mouth of the stream uh, can have an issue as well. Uh, but streams, as you know, are composed of all kinds of different habitats. There are riffle habitats where it's very, very shallow. The water is shallow and you can see the fish as they move up. There are rocky boulder contexts in which the fish have to negotiate around uh, to be able to move up the stream. And there are falls that they have to leap up, and that's where their power is necessary to move above. And then there are these places, and this is what an ish is. An ish is a deep, <coughs> quiet, slow-moving pool where salmon congregate. And this is what you can get to see. They see all of those habitats, and they see salmon come to the ish. And in the ish, that is the place in which they congregate, and they come back. So the ish then refers, we were able to hear the different dimensions in the elders. This term is not translatable into English. You never heard this term brought forth in an English. It always appears as ish, even when the sentence structure is English. So what is an ish? It's a multi-dimensional concept that once again speaks to the manner in which this deep philosophical cosmology of Fringet relationship is born of. It's woven throughout cultural practice. It's the deep pool where salmon congregate. But it's also a site index to harvest activity. We were told by uh, Huna Elder uh, Sam Hammond but when he went out with his grandfathers to streams <coughs> and in the, spring, in the uh, summer to go when they were going to go fish, his grandfather would get off the boat and he would go up the creek. And he would look for the ish. And he would see if the ish was full of fish. Because only if the ish was full of fish was the time right for there to be harvest of fish. So it's a site index to harvest activity. It has to be full of fish. During spawning time, later on, as the fish are moving up, it's a place of rest. And this resounds very powerfully in Shinget thought because of the understanding that the salmon, as they're getting ready to spawn, are poised on the point of life and into the next domain. So this is a time of rest and recuperation before they move further up. It's also a harvesting location. Issues are good places to harvest with gaffs or spoons or um, spears, which we'll see momentarily. They're oftentimes spawning locations because underlying them you will find the appropriate gravels, the reds for the sand. It is also, I discovered, a site of modification. Just as we learned earlier today about clam terraces and as I have been able to study through the years with the Hina people to see the intertidal stone fish traps, um, this is a site of modification as well, built upon that relational principle. It is also a location of philosophical contemplation, which we'll come to at the end. 
Now, Ish, in its multidimensionality, have names. Uh, George Ramos was not here before when the elders, uh, the, and I want to hear um, commend uh, Dr. Rosita Worrell, who bought, brought together the uh, traditional um, Clinton Elders Council to discuss this concept when it was brought forward. Uh, and George Ramos named, gave, gave names for the specific issues that exist in the Yakutat environment. So they are named phenomena. They're not just a generic ish. They exist as discrete named entities. And these are identifiable throughout coastal and interior Shinget, those the scholarship. We have um, uh, evidence from all the way from Tlaloc into the interior in Yakutat. All Shinget people share this underlying concept. Issues included in personal names, another of the woven uh, strands of Shingit tra uh, tapestry. There is Ish Kahit, which means uh, the Ish, the house by the Ish. And we also have uh, and the Ish Kahitan, where the people from um, the interior who have carried that name with them, and it is a part of their direct and identifiable uh, identity. So once again, the ish has all of these particular kinds of contributions. It is, as we see in the top, this deep hole. And I would argue that it also, what you saw in this, on the house front painting, I would suggest to Steve Hendricks that it's not the hole in the trap. The circle stands for the ish, where the salmon will congregate where they will recuperate. In the, amongst the southern Shinget, they use the spear to capture the uh, salmon at the ish. And this is a, a, a wonderful picture of the spear in action. If it'll come up, there it is. A wonderful young man uh, deploying the spear. And you can see the way in which it's, uh, it's distinctive. The spear means that it is thrown at the fish. In that sense, uh, the southern Shinget are different uh, from northern Shinget who use uh, a gaff hook. And here we see uh, Huna forms of gaff hooks. These are designed for different sized fish. These happen to be um, uh, made by and used by Thomas Mills on the, on the Neva River. And here we can see how the gaff hook is, in fact, deployed in the context of an ish. An ish um, in which the fish can be seen and the appropriate ones selected. Here we are on the Kowak River with James Martinez, who as a young boy used the spear. And this is, uh, on the Kowak River, it's referred to as Nakwish, our ish, in that location. Now we're going to turn to the issue of creation as a site of modification. We've understood its dimensions because we've seen what it looks like. And what we see here is a, a phenomenon that I've referred to as streamscaping in which uh, the stones, as you can see elsewhere in the, um, throughout the stream, take on that boulder-like patterning. But here, what the trustees on the Neva River have done is that they have rearranged and created this semicircular pool. And if you look at those rocks, you see they have lots of moss on them. They weren't put there yesterday. And so this has been created uh, to accomplish multiple things. It creates an issue. It creates a gaffing habitat, and it creates a spawning habitat. All of those uh, can be accomplished. This is another ish on the Excursion River. Now you might say and look at it and say, well, gee, that's a beautiful natural ish. But as I stood and observed this particular site, uh, Patrick Mills came to me and he said, you know we're not the first ones to live on this river. And that immediately alerted me to the quite regular construction of this. This is a linearly constructed falls. And it has been created by moving the stones from above down to create, the, create this falls. That almost sounds like what we heard about in terms of the clam terraces. But what it's done is that it's created habitat. It's created habitat for the salmon to rest and for them to spawn. And I, uh, this particular um, ish here, as we see the waters flowing quite nicely, 
And in September of 2004, it was quite rainy. But I, when I returned uh, the next year and spoke to Thomas about this location, he came up to me and he said, you know the ish, the water was too low this year. And what I had to do is move the rocks. I had to move the rocks so that the fish that were below could get up it. And when I came back to him the year after that, what he explained to me is his thoughts about trying to make the system self-regulate so that the water at different levels would nevertheless be accessible and the ish qualities would be retained. It would not have to be sacrificed by opening that up. So this is the way then in which dreamscaping, again, another intervention, a direct intervention based upon the relational cosmology, what is important to our spiritual brothers the salmon. What do they appreciate? What do they enjoy? And it's the ish. And so, in the context of the traditional scholars coming together and discussing George Ramos giving names, um, various different individuals, Clarence Jackson talking about the ish uh, that sits behind um, the village of Cake. Uh, Walter Sobolev then he, he wrote the following statement. He gave the following statement in King Yet, which has been translated. There were those who were knowledgeable about all kinds of subjects. This thing named Ish it was almost as if it were human and it was spoken to in that way, this Ish. This is how they valued this resource. It was as if their life depended on it. So they treated it with respect. Because they got their food from this place, is why they would speak to it. There was pride, there was honor given to the ish, so no one was to say anything foolish about it or to it. If it was said that we could laugh at it, it was not so. We were told not to talk to it in a foolish way, to, but to respect it. This is what the white man calls taboo. When you do this, there is a discipline, a law that will correct you. It will be like it falls on you. This is the way this is. All that is seen around us is said to be alive. Around us is what it is called. The Shinget people have known this to be true from time immemorial. Walter Sobel as a, a Clinket philosopher is using that concept, going deep into the spiritual relational cosmology and bringing forth uh, a deep statement. He also in another occasion when I spoke to him about Ish, he said to me, it is like a paradise for Sam. And I thought that was an extraordinarily evocative comment in the context of what paradise raises in people's ideas from um, Christian um, uh, cosmology. And that is, it's a, a pure place for them. A pure place where they rest on the precipice from life to death before they uh, fall into that next world to be rejuvenated. Richard Dauenauer subtitled it, The Reconstruction of Aquatoxene, Alive in the Eddy. Alive meaning at your fullest and complete ex existential form. Not in the, the, and it is in the ish where that particular full realization of salmon comes to its full fruition. Um, here we have Patrick Mills enjoying fresh caught coho salmon, uh, the cheeks and the jaw, uh, from the ish and the trusted relationship over many generations in the Neva River, the benefits of relational cosmological practice with salmon, and the joy it brings to those who uh, have the opportunity to do it, cannot be replaced. Cannot be replaced. Um, the report that uh, uh, on the uh, traditional knowledge and harvesting of salmon by one of in Yaklinkit is available from um, uh, the gentleman on the left, and uh, he indicated that he would uh, he would be sure to provide people with copies of that if they so wish. I'd like to acknowledge the elders and experts in Cloak and Huna for their wisdom and their patience. I'd like to thank Thomas Mills for his guidance on the Neva River. Uh, thanks to Wanda Culp for wonderful sketches such as the one you saw here. Thanks to Dr. Rosita Worrell, Clarence Jackson, and the 
Thank the traditional scholars for sharing their discussion of ish. Thanks to the Co Cooperative Association and the Huna Indian Association for their support and assistance. The funding for this was provided by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the Offices of Subsistence Management, and the Fisheries Information Service. And I was going to uh, ask David Katzik uh, to speak, but I don't think he's here, to speak about a particularly powerful commentary about the issue that he provided from the Chilkat River. And he said he was taught about Ish as a young man by his grandfather, and he knows precisely the one he's speaking about. There are probably several. But the one that he was taught by his grandfather about is, was about where the bubbles come up. The bubbles come up in that particular location. And his grandfather said, that's where the oxygen is very high. And that's why they come there to regain in their energies. So there is, uh, across the entire landscape, Ish has an enormous uh, contribution to the manner in which Shinget relate to salmon. And I'd like to thank all of those uh, who provided this information. Thank you.